right. We are streaming live now on Facebook. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, this is uh, Emerging Revolutionary War coming to you live tonight uh, on the uh, anniversary of the Battle of Trenton, December 26, 2021, 245 years ago on this day was one of the most important military actions in American history. Um, and uh, we're really pleased to be able to come to you live tonight to uh, do a special showing of the movie The Crossing, starring Jeff Daniels as uh, George Washington. Uh, and joining me in the uh, commentary of this movie will be Dan Welch uh, and Kevin Pollock. Um, and we're excited to be able to do this. This is uh, a watch party. So if you're interested in just watching the movie, uh, the movie is available to watch uninterrupted uh, on YouTube. Uh, so if that's kind of what you want to uh, sp spend the day uh, remembering this battle by watching this movie uninterrupted do that if you want to watch it with some history guys who are going to nitpick it and pick it apart and talk about what we like what we don't like um and uh in, in the relevance of this film overall uh then you are in the right place if that's what you're interested in because that's what we're going to be doing um but uh yeah we're we're excited you all are, are joining us tonight um uh, this is we're hoping this will be an interactive thing if you guys want to Drop in into the comments section on this video, uh, questions, uh, uh, thoughts on, on the movie, anything you want us to cover, any questions you might have, uh, we can talk about uh, those as we go through the movie as well. Um, but without uh, further ado, we're going to go ahead and start sharing uh, the movie. Um, so I will... You know, as Mark's going ahead and, and getting the movie going here, um, you know, Emerging Revolutionary War has spent a lot of time lately um, on focusing on the battles of, of Trenton and Princeton. Uh, and I think the, you know, the success of, of our bus tour back in November on the battles of Trenton and Princeton, um, the, the launch of the book Victory of Death by Mr. Mark Malloy there on the battles of Trenton and Princeton, really underscores how important that this moment is uh, during the American Revolutionary War itself. So we're very glad to have you with us this evening and taking a moment to recognize the anniversary uh, of these battles and this moment in the Revolutionary War. As we get started, you can see some of the, uh, the list of actors in this movie. You know, The Crossing was really the towards the tail end of this boom, if you will, of made for TV movies based on historical events uh, in American history. It really got the ball rolling after Ken Burns' American Civil War and Glory in the late 80s. And then we see the movie Gettysburg come out uh, for you Civil War fans in 1993, originally made for television uh, by Ted Turner, but eventually would make its way to the theaters. But Ted Turner really spurns on a lot of, of these made for television movies on American history topics, particularly the Civil War. And then we see uh, A&E uh, channel start kind of following suit. And so here we have uh, this, this particular movie with a, an interesting cast come out in the early 2000s, 2000 to be exact. Uh, and as the headliner, Jeff Daniels uh, is going to be playing George Washington. And there's a great uh, featurette about the making of this movie. Kevin can tell you a little bit more about some of the interesting facts of how Jeff Daniels gets cast as George Washington. Hey, hang on, I just want to jump in here real quick, too, because this opening sequence, I think, is really cool. And I think uh, the score for this uh, uh, is really uh, underrated. I think I think the music in this uh, movie is great. It's it's uh, akin to kind of, you know, you can hear, uh, Dan, you can probably talk more about the music with how it's made. It sounds like it's a synthesizer making it, but it's, uh, I really like the theme song. I kind of like this opening with the different, the bayonets moving and the historic shots of the maps and things like that. It's a pretty cool way to get started. Yeah, it has a lot of those commonalities with all these historical films. You think like Gods and Generals comes out two years after this, you know, and has the flags and whatnot. But I'm going to pause myself here so you can hear the setup for the movie. Britain and the Crown, the American army was decimated, overrun by the British in Manhattan, slaughtered by the hundreds by German mercenary troops known as Hessians. 
the Continentals hardly seemed a threat to the might of the British Empire in the Americas. As winter approached, the Continentals were cold, tired, and sick, and still the British chased them south toward the natural boundary between the two rich colonies of New Jersey and Pennsylvania, the Delaware River. I think that's a pretty good uh, build-up. I think it, it really kind of, in a very short amount of time, gives you a good sense of, uh, you know, how, how bad the, uh, the American army was at this point, like the whole cause of American independence, uh, and a good way to set up, uh, you know, that they went across the Delaware River, and that's where the story really kind of starts. Um, and here you can see, you know, I think you can tell me, uh, Dan, where this was filmed, uh, because the, the, the locales look, it looks good as far as being, uh, you know, uh, not a whole lot of structures, you know, if you, you're, as uh, Dan just mentioned, we were just up in this area, we did a, a great bus tour um, of the area in November, and most of these areas have been built up a lot. Uh, so tell us a little bit about the filming. Yeah, I, I would agree with you, Mark. Um, surprisingly, this movie's filmed on location in Alberta, Canada. Uh, but if you've spent some time around the crossing sites on either side of the Delaware River, they did a really good job of, of finding a location that really mimics some of the terrain and, and some of the, 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 you know, the, the general aesthetic of the landscape of what this area of New Jersey and Pennsylvania would have looked like uh, in the winter of 1776. Uh, I also think in this opening scene, we, we really get a good look at, at the army. Uh, it does a really good job of showing the overall morale and the overall condition that Washington's men are in at this moment. So I think it's a, it's a really great uh, beginning to set up the events to kind of give you that, that build up, that dramatic moment as, as the battle will eventually play out. Yeah, of course, this is, we're introduced right here to, to Alexander Hamilton. Uh, which uh, unfortunately, one of my gripes about this movie is that they, rather than making him the artillery officer he was at this time, uh, kind of fast forward to making him an aide de camp to George Washington. Um, which, you know, in my opinion, I think he has some great aide de camps that could have been portrayed uh, in that role to kind of give that view of the inner circle. You have uh, William Grayson. Uh, you have uh, uh, John Fitzgerald, so you got a lot of guys that you know you could actually focus on to give that. Instead, they turned it into Alexander Hamilton. But, but that opening shot of them, you know, trying to, to move these artillery pieces during the retreat, uh, yeah, I think first of all, it shows you you know the logistics of moving an army at that time, how difficult it was, uh, and, the, and you know kind of the issues they would have in that moving like giant piece of artillery and then having to just spike it and move it um which and also shows you that washington's losing men material and all sorts of things as they're as they're falling back across and, and here we're introduced to uh uh hugh mercer uh played by roger reese uh, and roger reese is a is probably the the second best known or, or best uh, uh, uh most talented if you will based on years in the acting profession and awards given uh actor in this movie uh next to jeff daniels and then of course the the actor that plays um general knox but roger reese um for those of you that love christmas movies uh stars and perhaps one of the, the best adaptations of a christmas carol um with george c scott playing uh, the lead role in that roger reese plays uh, Scrooge's uh, Ebenezer Scrooge's nephew in the movie, but and and here you have uh, Sebastian Roche playing uh, Colonel John Glover. Um, and those of you who travel to historic sites, I think it's interesting. Uh, uh, if you go to Mount Vernon, they have an introductory film. Sebastian Roche actually plays. Uh, uh, he actually plays George Washington um, and does a great job showing kind of this moment uh, right before uh, the crossing and they dramatize men's uh, moments uh, in a different way. So it's just great to see, you know, some of these historic actors that are also involved, uh, also involved with the uh, history sites as well. So we're gonna take a pause here for a moment and we'll get you some more volume and 
we'll catch up with what's going on here in early December 1776. Well, I, th I think I just want to comment on this too. I think this is great. It shows you we constantly think of the revolution as the American or the Patriots were the good guy, British or Hessians were the bad guy. This kind of shows you how complex the revolution was and that civilians were constantly caught in the middle between the two armies. And here is a, a, a businessman who's losing his uh, boating and, and ship and everything else like that uh, for George Washington. So. Whose orders? General Washington. Then God damn him for the bandit that he is. How am I going to make a living? Who's going to pay me? The Continental Congress. And I eternal thanks for your generous assistance in this matter. Right there! You ah! and your goddamn Continental Congress. I'll see you hanged. Every one of you. You too. You will all suffer the consequences. You don't stand a chance. Give up now. Hold in. Look lively. So they showed that, uh, you know, fighting happening right there uh, as they were getting across the river. Um, now, there was skirmishing that was occurring all along New Jersey as they were getting across. So there was definitely a lot of fighting that happened leading up to getting across the desert. But as far as people being shot off the boats as they were getting across, I think that's a little artistic license. The uh, uniforms, uh, first of all, I mean, we can talk about the costuming in general on the uh, in, in this entire movie, I think I think they get some things good, but I mean a lot of it obviously could be better. Um, I think if you talk to any reenactors and, and things like that, you can find all sorts of uh, with the uniforms and the costuming. I think the uniforms that the British wearing are, are very inaccurate. Um, I think they do show with the, the American army, you know, at least the how very hodgepodge a lot of the troops were. So you see someone wearing hunting shirts, some civilian clothes, some uniforms, uh, which, yeah, with a lot of different units, and especially during this time period, with people going back and forth, there was, uh, you know, all sorts of different uh, uniforms the guys were wearing. I like the make, I, you know, the, as far as the guys getting shot uh, in the makeup you see with the blood and, uh, in the Cross fight, things like that. That's all very accurate. Going really just a demoralized state. Of that. Gentlemen. And here we have a, a council of war that, that Washington is Six months holding ago, right here with his top City, generals and colonels. Um, and he kind of lays it out. I'll let, I'll let him speak here so you can hear duty. how he lays out the situation. Henry, how many pieces of artillery? 18, sir. Less than 2,000 men, 18 guns, and we presume to fight against the most powerful nation on the face of the earth. 
In doing so, we have been smashed and smashed again. We have been flushed and chased and punished. Now, I must write to Congress and tell them of our condition. Well, gentlemen, what shall I tell them? That we are on the west bank of the river, General. And that the British are on the east. And that there is no boat worth calling a boat on this river that is not in your hands. Yes, we have a reprieve. A few days or weeks until the river freezes over. And when the British walk across the ice with 20,000 men? Then we retreat. Again. Then the way is open and they take Philadelphia. What's left? We are left. So we have almost no food. No medicine, no blankets. I'm more of a physician than a general. And I tell you, we have jaundice and dysentery. So you tell me, in what condition are we left? You are right, General Mercer. An army without supplies cannot endure. I propose we endure. Therefore, we will find what we need. I think that's uh, Where is our all, all these numbers that he's, he's are pretty accurate as far as the uh, their enemies. situation and how destitute the American army was. Um, and how, you know, Washington, you know, just staying alive, keeping his army together on the Pennsylvania side of the river, how important. We are here. And that if the British were able to wait for that water to freeze over, they could walk across. I gave General Lee 2,000 men and proposed this route. I gave General Gates 1,200 men, and this was to be his route. If one of the armies were trapped, perhaps the other two could survive. They were to meet us here. Where are they? How can two armies simply disappear? Sterling, you were Surveyor General of New Jersey. You know every road in the state. Go and find them. Go today. Yes, sir. You go about your duties, General. Who was it? Outside. I think they had a comment. Yeah, Washington's hat is uh, very large in this uh, movie, um, which is, yeah, I don't think it's very accurate. Um, at least in one of the paintings I've seen of him. Uh, but it does show, you know, uh, and this, I think, is great talking to General Sterling. Um, and what they're discussing is really, yeah, the reinforcements that Washington's trying to occur on the southern bank of the Delaware River. And the uh, center of this is going to be Charles Lee's group, uh, which is kind of operating, you know, he's kind of hanging back, not really listening to Washington's lead to come join up with him. Uh, and then also uh, General Gates. Um, and, uh, and and that's going to come up in a scene in, in a few minutes. Uh, and this is the introduction of uh, Thomas Barclay, uh, who's inviting Washington to the house. Uh, those of you who came on our tour in November, uh, the house still exists. This is uh, a real house where Washington East does his headquarters as soon as he got across the river from his seat in Morrisville, Pennsylvania, um, which uh, uh, he used for the first part of his time in Pennsylvania. He's then going to move to the Keith House. Um, but they kind of center all of the, the drama of the crossing at Thomas uh, Barclay's house. But, uh, it's still kind of neat that they included that historic weapon. Mark, if I could just jump back to Washington's hat. We've had a few comments uh, about that. One thing that I think is interesting about the film with casting Jeff Daniels as George Washington, and we can debate later on if Daniels' portrayal of Washington is accurate or not, but at least in size it is. Washington in real life is about 6'4", roughly. Uh, Jeff Daniels is 6'3", and both were 44 years old. Uh, Washington was 44 years old at the time of the crossing, and Daniels is 44 years old in this film. So pretty neat that they were able to at least physically roughly match uh, Jeff Daniels to Washington at the time of the events. Yeah, yeah, I, I think so too. And, you know, I also like that they have Jeff Daniels. You know, he has his natural hair, uh, just like Washington had. Uh, Whereas the other people would have the uh, uh, wigs and things like that. So, but yeah, I think physically he does uh, kind of come up 
as Washington would have looked. Go, Alex. I'm very tired. I think I will rest. Yes, sir. Yes. To you, sir. The door is open. <coughs> well, Hugh. A rider from New York has arrived carrying intelligence. Oh, why in God's name did they call it intelligence? <laughs> What's with this batch? You don't want to read it? It's from Van Hagen. Van Hagen? No one hates the British like a Dutch merchant. What's he got to say this time? General Howe's banging a pretty little wench, name of Mrs. Loring. He has her in his bed every night, glassy-eyed and fornicating like a 15-year-old. That's very stimulating, Hugh, but where's the connection? Van Hagen credits Mrs. Loring with our continued existence. He says if it wasn't for Mrs. Loring, General Howe would be down here at the river with 20,000 men. Howe's so convinced we're finished, he's allowed Cornwallis to return to England. Oh, the damned fool. Cornwallis is the only commander he has who isn't an idiot. They're waiting for the river to freeze. Meanwhile, he's sent Colonel Rahl and 1,200 Hessians to occupy Trenton and to watch us, should we attempt to march to Boston. 1,200 Hessians? By God, Hugh, the man holds us in contempt. Well, with reason, sir, with reason. What reason? Less than a thousand men fit for duty. No food, no clothing. These Hessians are the best soldiers in the world. The boys we lead are as frightened of them as a Salem pastor at the sight of a witch. Hessians. Van Hagen writes that Howe expects us to plead for terms within the next fortnight. He intends to be generous. Generous? Well, I will see General Howe in hell before I come to him with a plea of surrender. Come along, you. Where to, sir? Let's have a look at Trenton. I've never seen the town. No, sir. Yes, you, right now. Oh, so, yeah, uh... And just uh, notice in some of the comments, yeah, if, if anybody wants to watch this movie without us uh, discussing any of the history or any of the items on here, please check out the link we posted in the comments. Uh, it has it takes you to the YouTube channel, so you can actually watch the movie uh, in peace. Uh, this uh, whole thing is really just to talk about the history, what they get right, what they get wrong, uh, what we like, what we don't. Um, and in this particular scene, you know, they show them, you know, keeping an eye on the, the, the Hessians over there in Trenton. I think that the, uh, the town that they have up here is, uh, that they use as Trenton is, is pretty good. Uh, you can see here they show the Hessians uh, across the river training, drilling in, um, in, in the fake Trenton. Do we know the, uh, Dan, if this was a... That that was created, or this, this was, was a cool uh, play the two of us uh, running down here the town. Yeah, it was a very small set that was constructed in Alberta. Um, and I think that's one of the things that when we, we talk about, you know, this, this quote unquote street fighting in Trenton, um, folks think of a lot of physical structures uh, in the town of Trenton itself because you're thinking, ah, capital of New Jersey, it's got to be quite a, a thriving metropolis, if you will, but it's really not. So um, building a set such as this was really. An affordable proposition for a, a movie of this budget. Where is General Lee? Sir? Mark and Dan, we had a good question come up here that I think 
will be touched on at some point tonight, but since it was asked, somebody was asking, were the Hessians mercenaries from Diane McVie? I've been told by historians they were not. If you're able to touch on that a little bit. Yeah, uh, I mean, that's a common thing. Yeah, we, we typically call, yeah, the Hessians mercenaries. They call them that in this. What is the a quote in this thing. We'll talk about it. Comes up later. Um, the, the Hessians are fighting. You know, usually when you talk about mercenaries, they're fighting for money. Uh, and... Uh, and, and the Hessians were professional soldiers, so they were paid, um, but uh, they were kind of contracted out uh, by the British Empire, um, and the princes were in charge of the over Germany of these different areas, the Bargenes groups, uh, and so they weren't just over here just for money, they were here because they were with their units, uh, which were being contracted out. So usually a more accurate term would be auxiliary um, rather than a mercenary. But uh, because, yeah, they were paid soldiers, but so were the British or American paid soldiers as well, they didn't necessarily be uh, mercenaries. Um, but there is that kind of uh, negative uh, uh, hint of that term mercenary. Uh, and there was, a, you know, getting back to this time, there was a lot of propaganda about the Hessians and how cool and bloodthirsty that's they that's were. The whole uh, and they kind of hint at that in this movie that it talks opinion? about. Um, Talks about how the, the American lads will run from them in a moment. They're some of the most fearsome fighters, uh, some of the most renowned uh, uh, European soldiers, or as Gage will say, European soldiers. But I will. Uh, uh, what does that mean? It means that the whole thing is a damned lunatic affair. But if you're determined to ride into hell, I'll go along. I also I also noticed in the comments some people talking about yeah Mercer um, you know he doesn't really have that you know they think he would probably have a thick Scottish accent um, which I would tend to agree with Hugh Mercer uh, uh, you know who's played by Roger Rees uh, you know was from Scotland had been at the Battle of Culloden came to America uh, and then was you know engaged in the revolution here after settling in Virginia uh, so yeah he probably had a, a pretty uh, thick Scottish accent, I would imagine. So, um, but you know, a lot of these guys' accents too. You hear them talking. You know, obviously nobody was alive at that time to, or is you know, able to hear what people actually sounded like. But I would think many of them had, you know, especially those that were educated in England, first generation had slight English accent. Some of the ones who had been here for generations might have had more of them. Right? Pretty interesting. To think about. This army is sufficient, General. And I'm not a rider. I'm a fisherman. Yeah, you can be a short man here, not let you forget it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm intrigued by your profession, and I notice your uniform is different. There's no uniform, madam. These are my own clothes. Just as this is my own hair, which God gave me. I will lay aside my contempt for fripperies and my disgust for the high church just long enough to join these gentlemen in an endeavor which is my own as well as theirs. But I will not clothe myself in silks and laces and play the silly ass in a padded wig. I am a marblehead fisherman of the Congregational Persuasion Man. So I was born, so I will die. Uh, Madam, let me not apologize, but rather explain the blunt speech of Colonel Glover. He was never one to hide his light under a bushel. <laughs> <laughs> he has no desire to be ungracious. No, indeed, man. I'm in your I think these, these are kind of interesting in the show, John Glover and, and, you know, and Knox and Washington. All these guys are from, yeah, different areas, a kind of a, a clash of cultures. And so you can imagine having uh, some, some of the uh, New England uh, you know, folk and Southern folk and everybody's kind of different uh, ways of life coming together in this army. And there's probably a lot of moments where they were offending each other and in a way or weren't used to each other. Oh, and this has got to be one of my favorite scenes here. Here's Mark's scene right here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, showing uh, 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 General Gates coming in. Uh, and so I'll, I'll let this play a little bit. This is a great scene. Um, it's deep in accuracy. Uh, it's not very accurate. Um, but they do get across that Gates, who's an English-born, uh, viewed by many as one of the best soldiers in the army, uh, and the potential threat to Washington's command of the army at this point.
would have had this meeting before, but I wanted to have General Gates here. I received this dispatch yesterday from the Continental Congress to His Excellency General Washington, Commander-in-Chief. The Congress, having come to the realization that Philadelphia cannot be defended, has removed to Baltimore. We leave you in full command with the power to make all decisions concerning the future of our struggle. So it is, gentlemen. We became a nation on the 4th of July six months ago. We held our three largest cities, Boston, New York, and Philadelphia. Since then, we have lost New York. Congress has fled from Philadelphia because we cannot defend it. We have lost every battle. And out of our great army, only a handful remain. The British have written us off. At this very moment, they are contriving the terms of our surrender, waiting for the Delaware River to freeze over us so that they may walk across it and present us with those terms. You have stated the situation, sir, quite clearly. Very well. Preserve your opinions, gentlemen. Hear me out. Across the river, 10 miles downstream, is the village of Trenton. It is held by 1,200 Hessians with Rawl in command. They have food, warm clothing, blankets, tents, cannons, muskets, ammunition, in short, everything we need. In four days, it will be Christmas. There will be a great deal of feasting and a great deal of drinking by the Hessians that day and night. I propose that on the eve of December 25th, we cross the river, march on Trenton, and attack the Hessians before dawn. And if God is with us, we'll take the whole lot of them. Now, there, there was a meeting where he did just this, where he kind of pulled off. Well, sir, I waited for you to broach this. What do you think? You would not wish to know, sir. Then you have objections. Many. Would you specify them? Gladly. Firstly, my dear sir, in order to attack, one needs an army. You do not have an army. Secondly, in order to attack, one needs soldiers. Your men are not soldiers. Thirdly, your troops always go in one direction. To attack requires the other direction. Shall I continue? By all means. In 11 days' time, the enlistments run out. Your men will not attack a fly before then, and why should they? They need only sit tight and go home. Next, there is no way to cross the river and keep such a plan from the Hessians. They have spies everywhere. The crossing will take hours, and long before you reach the other shore, the Hessians will have their artillery on your boats. Those big Durham boats of yours make damn good targets. Even a Yankee gunner couldn't miss them. And finally, you will not defeat Hessians. They are European soldiers. The most disciplined, the most rigorously trained, the best soldiers on earth, and you bloody well know that. Why, well, their superiority... Their superiority will be their undoing. Oh, my dear sir, please. <laughs> their training has not prepared them for an attack of this nature. They will be roused from their beds, and we will not give them time to achieve the formations with which they are comfortable. I fear for your sanity, General. I fear that you are no longer fit for command. How dare you? No, sir, how dare you? I am sick to death of your looking down that long nose of yours and equally sick of the pretense of military competence that you and your colonial cronies display. You are no soldiers. And you, sir, are a damned poor leader. You can't face defeat, and so you seek annihilation. Have you finished? Surrender. This revolution is over. So we surrender. We weigh the pros and cons, and reason prevails. 
But you see, sir, I am an unreasonable man as well as a poor soldier. But you are right. My men are not soldiers. They are lads. 16, 17, 18. They run away. They fear the Hessians as they fear death. All this is true. Yet, they have put their trust in me. They could have deserted. Thousands have. But these lads have not. They remain with me. And I, not you, General Gates, I command this army. And if I, a bumbling Virginia farmer, should decide to lead them into hell, they will follow me into hell. Now you hear me, and you hear me well. You will ride out of my camp. You are not to discuss what has occurred here tonight, not with your staff, not with your men. Put your pistol on him, Alex, and go with him. See him onto his horse and out of this camp. And if he tries to take his men with him, shoot him. You would not dare. Try me, General Gates. Only try me. So yeah, I think that's a, a pretty awesome scene in the movie. Uh, uh, it, now, this event didn't actually happen. Uh, it brought his men down uh, to uh, Washington's camp near Newtown. Um, and then he's going to leave the camp. And he's going to head uh, down to Baltimore. Uh, where Congress is meeting. Uh, he actually feigns illness uh, and leaves. Uh, one of his aides, John Wilkinson, is actually going to stay with Washington's army. He'll actually leave a memoir that, that uh, talks uh, later on all about this. Um, but this whole scene of, yeah, uh, you know, it does show you an idea of, you know, how desperate this whole gamble and plan of Washington was at that time. Um, and it it shows you that you know, there was, even in the high command of our Washington's army, uh, big doubters as to whether the revolution itself was going to be successful. I mean, Washington himself even writes about how he thinks the game is pretty near up. Um, so it kind of does a good job of showing that. But this idea that they were going to take gates out by gunpoint uh, to keep away from his men is, is a bit ludicrous. Uh, but, uh, but again, it's uh, some of that artistic license. Um, these scenes, I think, are great. Uh, show, I mean, you can just imagine the, the army in this weather, uh, some of them without tents and, and whatnot, having the stand guard. And most of their uh, Washington's army enlistments were expiring on January 1st, 1777. So you can imagine uh, many of them waiting to, to go home. And I love this scene. Yeah, the guy shaving in the middle of this. And yeah, you can imagine uh men doing stuff like that uh you know, even at this awful time and this this is a great scene showing green pointing out the the plan of attack where you're going to cross the river and march towards trenton uh, and there's this great scene yeah with the uh the german regiment um which i think is is kind of an interesting story that it is true that there was a, a you know german soldier uh and these guys yeah they talk about the Riflemen who can't get bayonets fixed onto their weapons. Uh, they, all the Germans weren't Hessians. There were, there were a lot of Germans that were fighting on the Hessian side. In fact, at the battle trend, uh, some of the, the Germans are yelling at the Hessians to surrender in German. So it's kind of shows that international aspect to all those happening uh, uh, during the Revolutionary War. Yes, Captain Heinemann. Mine boys are Pennsylvania German, and they're good boys and brave boys. But to them, the Hessen sind wie die uh, Teufel. Devil, wie die Devil. And if I tell them last moment that we fight the, the Hessen, they become too nervous. Um, but if I tell them today, we can talk about it. And uh, it's, it's better, better this way for us. I think. Better this way. What do you think? Well, then tell them. It's safe enough. No one can understand a word they say anyway. Interesting uh, when they're talking about how 
you know, secretive, they're trying to keep uh, this operation. Uh, and spies was a real problem. Uh, and I think it's kind of interesting that they kind of uh, mention, um, you know, that they're trying to keep this secret. And this scene is kind of interesting, too, with the, the two soldiers uh, reminiscing on smoking tobacco. And I don't understand this part where he's dripping the candle wax over his flint off musket so that it will fire in the rain. I don't, you know, maybe somebody can talk in the comments if they've ever seen a primary source of anybody think something like that. I didn't, I didn't come across it myself. But uh, it's also interesting in this film. You'll see it when we get to the battle trend. You know, you pick all the all the action uh, happening as hand to hand combat. And this one guy and this one musket is the only one that actually uh, which is not true at all. Uh, so it's just not sure why the why the actor decided to do that or why the director decided to do that. At this point. And this is one of my another great scene here is Washington going to the Conkey's Ferry, uh, uh, where he's going to meet with Samuel McConkey and have a glass of Madeira, um, which is Washington's uh, uh, favorite uh, uh, drink. I've I even got some Madeira here myself. It's uh, the Rare Wine Company it makes a great George Washington Madeira. Please, sit yourself. Oh, it's a shame. But I always imagined one day your excellency would come in here and be asking me for a bottle of Madeira. Conky, there's not a bottle of Madeira between here and Philadelphia. Thank you. God be praised. It's a year since I've tasted such a Madeira. The bottle is yours. Drink with me. Oh, no, no. Madeira is great. If you never had it, it's, uh, it's very sweet. It's an it's a after dinner oh, okay. wine. Like, the amount that, you know, you look at Mount Vernon and Washington's record, they, they drank copious amounts of it. I can only imagine uh, a lot of headaches from it. But. You can keep your mouth shut. <laughs> Good job. Very well. I want this house tomorrow, all day. I want it for my headquarters. I'm going to cross the river tomorrow with 2,000 men and attack. You mean the bastards at Trenton? Yes, the bastards at Trenton. General, may I take you up on your kind offer? Sure. When you came in, General, did you not notice the ice on the river? Nothing to bother us. Yeah. Not now, sir. But the Delaware is a strange and curious river. The frost comes and it pours forth into the northern valleys. She'll probably be cakes of ice in a day or two, and it'll get worse for every day after. We cross tomorrow. Oh, for Christ's sake, General. Forgive the impertinence, but why not wait for spring? This is a cause I love. It's an army I love. I love it, too, more than I can say. Then why not wait? Because if I do not cross tomorrow, there will be no army. I think that, you know, kind of gets it across. You know, and this is, you know, and we can debate, yeah, uh, one of what you want to have the debate over Jeff Daniels as... George Washington. Uh, I've seen, like I said, Washington's been portrayed in numerous different miniseries, yes. uh, and a couple different theatrical uh, things. In my opinion, you know, I think, I think Daniels, you know, kind of gives you an inside look on, on what was probably going through Washington's head through a lot of stuff. But his outward demeanor seems much too informal than from what I've read of Washington. Uh, I've always maintained that David Morse and uh, the John A. Adams miniseries really gets Washington the best as he would have, you know, tried to make himself clear to others. Uh, a lot of people complain that he's too old or looks too old in that that uh, film. Um, and like I said, phys physically, I think Jeff Daniels really gets Washington right. Uh, and like I said, I think his, you know, a lot of what he says can honestly be his inner monologue. But I, I think 
Washington went through great pains with how he presented himself to others. Uh, so. That's a damn fool question. I have no intention of attacking in daylight. But would you? Glover, speak plainly, if you will. Very well. Let us say we push off the boats at half past five. Full darkness. That will give us six and a half hours for crossing. You plan to march to Trenton at midnight. A night march in this weather with men who will be wet, freezing, and already exhausted. If you can whip them and the guns along at two miles an hour, you can get to Trenton before dawn. We will do three miles an hour. Maybe. I'm not saying you will. I'm not saying you won't. But there's ice in the river. And as God is my witness, there's no man on earth who can carry that army across in six hours. Or ten hours. So you will be coming to Trenton in daylight. Providing we can cross that damn river at all. That last you said. Son. Providing we can cross it all. I think these uh, scenes are, are great in showing also, yeah, that the plan was never to attack during the day. The plan was to get there before the sun rose. Uh, and, uh, and I think Glover in the scene is providing a good counterbalance to the reality of the situation. Um, and, you know, Washington knew this too, going into it, that this, this was a potential. Um, and that's where they came up with the password for the whole operation of being victory or death. Um, and, you know, it's the same thing that we watched that Jeff Daniels told Daniel McConkey, uh, if he doesn't act now, uh, there's not going to be an army for them to even do anything. Well, I think Washington's plan, I think you're seeing the real disparity between Glover the realist and Washington the idealist at this moment. Uh, that timetable, logistically, is just impossible, even in ideal conditions. But this is something we see from Washington really throughout the whole war. Uh, and this movie doesn't even really go into how complicated the, the whole operation was, that it wasn't just crossing at McConkie's Ferry, but we were gonna have guys cross down, across from Trenton, guys crossing uh, further down with uh, Ken Walder's guys, um, you know. So, so knowing that there were these three, at, down at Bristol, that there were these three different crossings and that two of them didn't happen. Uh, but you see this routinely throughout Washington's career at Germantown, at Brandywine. I mean, and whenever he's making plans, it seems like that they're overly complicated. Um, and yeah, you think he would learn from some of them, but still continues to go. Uh, I think this is a cool scene. I love the music, uh, showing the excitement of the guys getting together, marching out, not knowing necessarily exactly where they're going. Uh, but uh, knowing that, you know, they have to do something, so. Yeah. And then they were gathering, this would be yeah, Christmas day around sunset as uh, they gather and start marching towards the, the crossing site right uh, And of course they show the artillery, which is gonna play a big role Washington crosses with 2,400 men, 18 pieces of artillery. Uh, that is, you know, showing you yeah, the, the, the state of the troops, many of them missing shoes and whatnot. Um, and the banners, too, you know, all the different types of flags that they carry. You know, the, a lot of people say, you know, the famous painting, the behind them, the, the United States flag, the Stars and Strikes, had been officially adopted by this point. So each regiment had their colors that they carry. You know, I think one other thing to, to pay attention to as we pick up the narrative here on the afternoon and evening of the 25th and into the 26th is the weather. Uh, one of the things that the movie gets wrong is the lack of real snow or otherwise um, that is blanket in the area and heading in that direction. So keep in mind as, as we move towards the crossing itself and then the battle on the other side of the Delaware, there was a, a blinding blizzard as one uh, participant of the battle recalled. Um, so unfortunately, and I would guarantee towards the time of year this was filmed and the limited budget as it was made for television, um, just not enough snow to really be accurate with the weather at this moment. Yeah, and you'll see that, you know, it, it looks like it's kind of like lightly snowing through a lot of those scenes. And then also like in the, yeah, the fighting down in Trenton. And yeah, when you read the actual uh, 
uh, letters from the guys who were there. They talk about it. He, yeah, uh, a blowing storm with snow, sleet, hail, rain, um, and then it was just, uh, pretty miserable. Um, and here you see uh, Washington having his, his final directions he's giving to his commanders there uh, that night. The army will divide into two sections. General Green and I, commanding the first section, will take the Pennington Road. General Sullivan, commanding the second section, will take the River Road. We will enter Trenton, God willing, no later than 6 o'clock in the morning. It will still be dark. You wanted a few words, Colonel Glover? Yes, sir. Gentlemen, I want discipline and speed in loading and unloading. No interference with my oarsmen. Each boat will have one of my men in command. His word is law, whether he gives his orders to private soldier or to General Washington himself. He will be at the tiller. As for the crossing, I am in command. Will you put your word on that, sir? You heard Colonel Glover. Loading and unloading and on the river, he is the supreme commander. No one is to countermand his orders. Any questions? Very well. I bid you all Godspeed and good luck. And a Merry Christmas to all of you. Merry Christmas. Anyone who wanders in, the men land wide in the circle. Done, sir. What time is it, Alex? Six ten, sir. I like that they mentioned the um, uh, uh, you know, first of all, you know, obviously Glover's marble headers and the importance they're going to play in this whole operation. They obviously played a big role in evacuating Washington's army from Brooklyn over to Long Island. Um, and they're going to play a big role, yeah, in being able to successfully get these guys across the river on that night. Um, and then I also like, uh, uh, you know, showing that Mercer is going over to secure the other side and perimeter, uh, which, you know, they did have soldiers that went over there. Among them was James Monroe. It's interesting, you know, again, for Hollywood, I'm surprised they don't include characters like James Monroe because... Uh, he was one of those people that was involved in this that isn't portrayed. Um, and then, uh, uh, you know, and we can talk about this scene too. I mean, when I talk about uh, Washington was very careful with how he portrayed himself. I think that this, this whole scene, you know, you get Washington's really, uh, you know, how upset he was that they weren't moving quicker and how unsure he was how successful this was going to be, uh, which is all very true. But the whole thing where he... Uh, you know, kicks Henry Knox and says, move that fat ass, Henry. I don't know if uh, that's something that uh, Washington would have actually done. Really well. I, I would agree with that, Mark. And perhaps the, you know, next line, uh, you know, don't swing your balls or you're swamped the boat. Also, it seems out of character for George Washington. <laughs> but perhaps is one of my favorite lines from any American war movie. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, for sure. Very uh, entertaining yeah, about that. insulted me how he said that in an army that hasn't eaten in three months it's damn near treason to be fat did he now come on henry snow night for bickering to the boats gentlemen yes sir sir Go with General Green and General Knox. I'll be right along. 
I give you command on shore. I want you to wait to the last boat. Everyone crosses, do you understand? Regardless of the time, regardless of what happens, we cross and march on Trenton. No discussions, no arguments. We cross and attack. I understand. Good. I'll see you on the other side. Swamp the boat. Cast off. Yeah, there's a comment here. Yeah, they, they didn't have, you know, they show them going on these docks and looting and any uh any docks like that at the site at the time um and then this scene of them actually rowing across um and then they, they have them singing a speed band as they go across and i don't know the the history of this particular song i don't know if it's of the era but i haven't read of anything either that they really would have been singing as they, they went across um, Again, the whole idea of the whole operation would be as intuitive as possible. Um, I'm not sure. A uh, bit of artistic license. Hold together. Cape, give them a count. Sally Brown, she's a bright Malacca. Way roll and go. She drinks rum and chews tobacco. Spend my money on Sally Brown. Again, the uh, yeah, right now it doesn't look like it's snowing at all um, as they go across there. Um, I was surprised, yeah, you know, they don't do the, they don't try to recreate Emanuel Loitza's painting of Washington crossing the Delaware with Washington handing solely in front, which I thought was interesting because that's probably the greatest cultural touchstone of this whole operation. Um, you know, I think it's also interesting that. You know, in general, that the crossing is the you know, that's the name of the movie. It's based on the, the book by Howard Fast, which is the crossing, and the, the paintings about the crossing. And you know, the crossing kind of gets the center of attention. Uh, and in my opinion, you know, I think that the, the actual combat at Trenton um, and at Princeton later, and also Aston Paint Creek, I think those acts are more deserved of, uh, of the, the focus on the attention. But it's interesting that this. The, the military maneuver of getting across the river kind of gets the lion's share of the, the attention. Uh, and they, you know, it was obviously super significant and very difficult, uh, and they were able to pull it off. And this scene, too, where Mercer says, you know, and I think these, these things are great showing, you know, that there were civilians that were going around at that time. There was a fear of spies. And that they would round them up to try and keep them. I wish they would have included the story of John Riker in this. Uh, I think that's such a great story. That one of the civilians they picked up was a was a doctor, um, and that he you know gets him to come join with them on the on the march. Uh, and James Monroe, Lieutenant James Monroe with the Third Virginia, lets them come along. And Monroe is actually wounded, and because Doctor Riker was there, he's able to clamp his artery and. Save James Monroe's life, uh, which is a lot of people don't know that story, um, and I think it's kind of interesting that, they, that the movie decided to show that they were rounding up, you know, holding the civilians just to, uh, uh, 
to keep the operation as secretive as possible. Um, and then, you know, these scenes of just the, the guys kind of waiting, you can imagine all of these soldiers, once they get across, and then just kind of waiting for the whole army to get across through like blue as one, one close to Listen to me. Listen to me. In a few hours, we will march south to attack Trent. If word of this gets out, hundreds of my men will die. You will be detained for three hours after we march, then you will be set free. I am sorry that you are suffering, but we are all suffering. Three and a half, maybe four hours to daylight. God damn it, Hugh, I know that. That's it, no more talk of time. Yeah, see in the comments, yeah. Uh, imagine, yeah, Washington telling the civilians his whole plan of attack. Uh, and then also the the fact that, yeah, again, that the weather, they, you know, Roger mentioned they won't be able to see 10 feet in front of them. So a little bit. That, that snowing, swirling snowstorm. General. It's done, sir. All across. Ready the men, Alex. Well, there's no time to lose. We march in ten minutes. Sir. To your brigades, gentlemen. Sir. Sir. Glover. How are your fishermen? Tired, sir. But they'll march. How are they armed? Pikes, sir. Fishing pikes. <laughs> well, you and your men lead Sullivan's column. Get with it. Come on, lad. Look alive. So now they're moving into the next phase. You know, they successfully crossed the, the river, uh, and they begin now the nine-mile march on Trent. Uh, which I think, you know, again, they, they kind of show you know, how difficult this would have been. And you can just imagine, as they show with Lover and his men, how it's awesome they would have been after getting crossed, and then having to continue with the, the march. Uh, this is the beginning of the what's going to be the, the actual combat. Mark, before we move too far away from the, the crossing, too, we had a question from Carl Thacker asking, how wide was the Delaware River at the crossing site of the county's ferry? Oh, I don't. Uh, I forget the, the exact uh, yardage. Uh, it, it was not very far. Um, and you can go visit the site today. It's at uh, uh, Washington Crossing, Pennsylvania. Um, we were just there. I mean, uh, it wouldn't have been that far, but you can imagine with that many people trying to get across there. It was the narrowest point in that area. That's where the ferry was, uh, and that's why Washington selected it um, uh, as the location to, to cross. Um, but so it wasn't wasn't extremely wide, and I think the the portrayal makes it like you can't see the other side. Now that night, because of all the snow and everything like that, that may have been the thing, but uh, but they kind of make it look, I think, a bit wider than it was. And even though it's it, it doesn't sound that far, 300 yards, you also have to understand the current that they're contesting against as well. I mean, rowing these boats back and forth, freezing temperatures, crappy weather, fighting this current to and from each way. Glover's men are absolutely exhausted. And now you're going to put them along with the army on a nine mile march. That's These guys were tough as nails for sure. Yeah, and then when you, I mean, when you also uh, think about the ice flows that were in the water as well. Alex. And this scene is cool. I mean, they show you, you know, how exhausted the guys would have been that any stoppage they probably fell to the ground. Uh, and there's actually some great first person uh, accounts of uh, a guy who actually you know, sat down in the, in the snow and uh, was going to fall asleep uh, before some of the sergeants came up and roused him to keep marching. Instead of, he had told him to get back up, uh, that he might have actually just fell and froze to death on the march. Uh, and there are stories that, you know, two men uh, froze to death on the march to Trent. Um, so, you know, you can imagine as you guys are going along, every time they stop, they just want to get some rest. Come on, lads. Two more miles and we're there.
again in this scene. So this is where they divide. That's Sullivan. Uh, his man. Um, you know, he continued on the, the River Road, and then Green and Washington took the Pennington Road. Uh, of course, they're showing all of this happening in daylight. With, yeah, no, no uh, but you know, it's still dark when they when they diverged. Um, and that little area where they diverged called uh, was called Birmingham, okay, West Trent. Uh, you can actually go to that intersection. It's all developed up now with uh, so building uh, things like that. that kind of cool where they where they divide. Uh, and Washington's going to be going into Trent two locations from the from the north, and then also uh, coming in from the, uh, the west. You know, before we get into the combat scene here, one of the things that I want to alert the watchers, viewers this evening is the level of violence in this movie. Think about it. It's, it's the year 2000, and this is a made-for-TV movie. If you think back to some of the Ted Turner movies, um, made-for-television movies like Andersonville and Hunley and Gettysburg, um, you know, they're not using squibs. You don't see the, the pink dust, ex you know, or the pink mist explode from bullet impacts. Um particularly the use of bayonets and some of the scenes coming up. Uh, this is pretty heady stuff for a made-for-television movie in 2000. Yeah, I think it's also interesting that this is coming out in 2000, uh, which is the same year The Patriot came out. Um, so I think these are the, you know, two of the, the biggest production, you know, other than John Adams, uh, that, that focus, and that doesn't focus solely on, you know, revolutionary combat, uh, but, uh, but that, yeah, 2000 was a big year for some of the more uh, pictures. Uh, and this scene uh, is interesting. They show uh, How many Hessians in the an outpost of Hessians. Alexander Hamilton and a couple guys go in to the, sleep and take out the, the Hessian. Made a great over, celebration yesterday. Um, which, as you mentioned, Dan, I think it really does get across. It's pretty attack, violent for a made for TV movie. They even used to be in the Mount Vernon, uh, one of their theaters there, too, uh, which I do think is accurate in getting across, uh, you yes, know, sir. how bloody and graphic uh, the actual combat was. But Brilliant. this particular thing never happened. Uh, Hamilton was with his whole crew. Uh, there was an outpost uh, where the first shots of the, the actual battle rang out. Uh, it was, you know, less than a mile outside the town. Uh, I do like that they show the Hessians, you know, in uniform, getting ready. They don't buy in the whole of uh, them being over them. Very bloody. So, yeah, they, they show kind of, yeah, them go in and just kill all these guys. In, in actuality, the, the Hessians came out. They saw the Americans kind of approaching kind of like this, what you see. And I like this scene where you see the entire American army show up. Um, again, at the time, it would have been snowing, you know, blowing snow all around. Then they fired a few shots, and then they, the, the Hessian outpost fell back into the town uh, and started raising the alarm for everybody else. Uh, this shows them pausing right outside the town and getting their win. But I do like that they show the synchronization uh, between the two columns uh, because for, I mean, they, they did it within five minutes where Green's column hit on the Pennington Road and just in a couple minutes later, Sullivan's guys hit down on the River Road. Uh, so this scene where they show them looking at their clocks and everything, I think it's pretty cool in showing that but those two columns actually did hit at, at pretty much the exact same time, uh, which was right about eight o'clock in the morning. And it, by that point, yes, it was daylight, uh, which was what not washing what not what Washington wanted, but uh, ultimately what, what he was forced. I do think this scene where Washington says the army will advance is pretty cool. Uh, they do show Nazi yeah, rolling his artillery. 
Washington at one moment, cry out, keep with your officers. Like you. It's a, 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 a quote that I think is very good. Here you see Hugh Mercer telling his men to press him. Village. Again, this isn't very accurate in the sense that it's not showing, uh, you know, as they came into town, that they went straight for the, the high ground where King and Queen Street met, uh, set up their artillery up there. And then throughout all this time, the Hessians would have been fighting them. There had been shooting back and forth. Um, but, and then they do show, you know, the, the importance of the artillery in the battle, as they were just kind of raining down artillery fire into the streets. Uh, and here you see, yeah, we're, we finally are introduced to Colonel Rawl. Um, now, this, they show him, yeah, yeah, totally inept and unprepared, uh, not ready for his attack, whatever. Um, when they did, you know, alert him and, you know, he opened the window and looked out and immediately got down and dressed just as they showed him. And yeah, like I said, this combat here, I think, uh, accurate in showing how vicious some of this hand to hand combat was. I think one of the more graphic moments is when he hits the bayonet in the guy and it gets stuck in the wood behind him. Yeah, it's pretty graphic, but accurate to the sense of how brutal uh, they're fighting them. Um, and the Hessian uniforms, I don't think, are very accurate um, with a lot of the details. But uh, I get to, you know, they show them a lot of them not wearing coats or, uh, you know, they're in their underwear and stuff like that. Uh, most of the guys actually were in full uniform, you know, they were sleeping on their weapons. Uh, and they were re responding to attacks nonstop for the, the previous couple weeks. So uh, while they were taken by surprise, they were entirely uh, inept in, in being able to put up a resistance. In fact, Washington writes about how they put up a uh, resistance, but they didn't know exactly how. Come on, 
First to a meadow here. I think you talk about the apple orchard, just uh, uh, the town, uh, which is where Paul's men are eventually going to be uh, pushed out, and eventually go down to the weapon. Um, again, you know, I wish they would have shown them actually firing volleys back and forth at each other. Because uh, the Hessians are pushed out of the town and they drive their way back in and pushed out again. Wall tries to make a flanking maneuver, but it's turned off. And it's finally shot like this guy shows you that climactic end of the battle. The sessions are going to be close to the So that's the climactic end of the, the fighting where the, the Hessians finally throw down their weapons and they go around on uh, all sides and here they are surrendering. I think this is kind of a neat scene too where they show the Americans finally reaching and, and you know uh, moving with the prisoners. Uh, and this was a you know kind of a major moment was that Washington you know, took them prisoner. Um, you know, a lot of Americans weren't shown quarter in some of the actions previous to this, uh, and some of the ones later that Washington not, uh, you know, authorizing a reprisal on surrendering soldiers was a, a humanitarian act uh, at this moment. Now, there's a, a, a scene here where they're going to show him meet with, oh, you know, dying wall. In this scene, where General Green, General, uh, Colonel Rawls' sword. Yeah, here you go. Send it to Congress. General Green says something to the effect of, uh, you know, that well, they're just, uh, aren't we fighting? Yeah, they've taken the houses. Uh, I sent Captain uh, which actually, uh, David Hackett Fisher in his book, uh, Washington's Crossing, is an appendix where he talks about uh, some of that. Um, you know, some of that comes from Howard Fast, who wrote the, the novel about this movie um, that the movie's based on. It's kind of interesting. 
Um, but this scene of Washington and Rawl, there are some uh, accounts of them, whether they actually met or not. Um, you know, Rawl was wounded and then taken to first the Methodist church and then eventually back to the Casey uh, Potts house. Where those of us who went on the, the tour in November, we actually got to go see where his headquarters were and where the, uh, uh, today is a, a large Catholic church uh, that was built on there. Um, but there is a plaque denoting his headquarters were where he died. But only to General Washington. He'll surrender to me. Oberst, Sie haben gar keine andere Wahl. Sie müssen sich zu General Mercer ergeben. Jetzt. Ich bin ein hessischer Offizier und muss mit General Washington sprechen. Get Washington. Bring him here. He won't come. Tell him he damn well must come. If there's one thing we should understand, it's defeat. His enemy is dying. Tell him that. General Mercer says you cannot let him die without speaking to him. It's a courtesy of war. Courtesy? There are no courtesies of war, Nathaniel. This is not a parlor game where I must pay my respects to that stinking mercenary who killed 500 of my men in Brooklyn, slaughtered them when they tried to surrender, skewered them in the backs with his bayonets. Do you want me to weep for those bastards, men who kill for profit? Our own cause is at its heart. A fight against British taxation, is it not? In the end, sir, we all kill for profit. The British and the Hessians. And us. Yeah, I don't think Washington would have agreed with that at all. Um, but I do like that he mentioned uh, his personality upset at the British, well. uh, or the Hessians for, you know, what they did at, in the New York service. campaign. Um, cause yeah, it was many, uh, uh, like I said, there, there were many accounts of Americans surrendering and then being uh, killed in the process. Uh, so I think getting across the Washington's disdain, um, you know, for their enemy, uh, something that he personally held, but yeah, whether he would actually ever show that in his emotions, I don't think, in, in real life. He asks if you are... I am Washington. My soldiers are good and tough Brauchen Sie sie nicht. Nehmen Sie Ihre Waffe. Aber lassen Sie ihnen Ihr Geld und Ihre Würde. In Washington wasn't there. Died. Gentlemen, where do we stand? But this scene is good too. It shows you that the results. Tell Knox I want the cannons loaded and rigged for marching. What else? Um, three ammunition wagons, 49 Hessian horses, blankets, clothes, about five tons of flour, meat, uh, cornmeal. How many prisoners? Over 900, sir. We haven't an exact count yet. 30 commissioned officers, also all their colors and drums. We'll find some drummers. I want a beat when we march out of here. Captain Heinemann. 
I want you to march with the Hessian officers and have one of your German lads with every group of Hessian prisoners so that we will be able to speak to them. Your men will inform the Hessians that any man who tries to escape will be shot. Is that plain? Yeah, now get to it. We march in half an hour. Where are we marching to, sir? Back to the boats and across the river. <laughs> but the men are exhausted. They're sleeping in the roads, in the meadows. They can't hold their heads up. I, too, am exhausted, gentlemen. Now listen to me. We have won our first victory in 12 months. We have attacked the enemy for the first time, and out of some miracle or the graciousness of God or the idiocy of war, we have survived. What can you be thinking? Have we won a war? Gentlemen, this is only the beginning of a war. We have 2,000 men. The enemy has 20,000. And I swear I will not eat, nor will I sleep until I put that river between him and us. Now, go to your brigades, gentlemen, and prepare to march. Yeah, yes, uh, this is what Washington's going to do right after the battle. You can imagine how exhausting it was for these soldiers who have crossed the river, marched nine miles, fought a battle, and marched nine miles back and crossed again. Wounded? None. Here again, Washington is, is learning that he had no casualties, which isn't entirely true. Uh, he had a, a handful of men uh, who were wounded. Among them, as I mentioned, was James Monroe. Uh, again, they included that, but still uh, pretty amazing uh, through all of that to not have uh, any sort of major casualties in the sense of four men killed or wounded. Hessians had, you know, about 100 killed and wounded and 900 taken prisoner. The Americans only had, yeah, probably two who died on the march and then, uh, you know, about four who were wounded uh, during the actual combat, so. Why did they do it? I suppose they trust you. More the fools. And love you. Very well, Hugh. Best get your men ready. Sir. You know, through this whole movie, you know, obviously Washington's a central character. Uh, and I think that that ending there of showing, you know, the, the, it's him, uh, the men who are willing to do all of this for him. But this campaign is really going to solidify that call uh, of George Washington with the whole it's going to you know, carry on through the whole war. It's going to be challenged. It's going to be you know, a difficult seven years. But you know, this campaign is so important in George Washington becoming the George Washington we know and love today. Um, one of my critiques of this movie is I really wish they would have carried on the story to include the other uh, nine crucial days of, uh, of this campaign include the Battle of Assin Creek and the Battle of Princeton. I think, you know, I think this whole campaign is really preserving the blockbuster Hollywood treat of, uh, yeah. Um, and maybe that will come with it. You know, it's already been written. Uh, it's, a, it's a pretty amazing story. Uh, but I think this does, does justice for, you know, the actual crossing in that first battle is important. And here at the epilogue, they kind of give you a little overview of of where these people live.
Mercer, of course, yet has a sad fate. Major was killed at the Battle of Princeton, reportedly losing. And not the bullet wound that killed him. It was the bayonet wounds that killed him. So a little inaccuracy there. I think it's interesting that Glover, yeah, is going to, uh, you know, they don't tell, say that, yeah, but, you know, when the enlistments expire, it's Glover's men at least. And then Alexander Hamilton, yeah, which of course they put him in the wrong role uh, in the movie. But, you know, goes on to, you know, now has become kind of a central figure thanks to the, the musical that came out of that movie. Henry Knox, I think I saw a question earlier, Jim Walsh asking if he actually wore glasses. Um, he did, uh, but I don't know if he wore them all the time as a kind of version. And yeah, Colonel Rawl is buried there. Sure. You can actually go visit there today. Any of these uh, uh, sites uh, from the actual battles you want to see Red Cross and happen, you can check out in my book, uh, Victory or Death, um, which includes driving tours and walking tours of the area. I think this is an interesting postscript too. Like, uh, how many Hessians remained in America um, and then stayed on to become American? Yeah, a good portion of them actually end up in Winchester, Virginia. Right. Well, I that ends the uh, um, the watch party of the the movie The Crossing. Any final uh, takeaways from you gentlemen on this, uh, this movie? You know, I think we had a, a lot of different points of discussion throughout the movie and, and some of us in the comments, you know, we really poked a lot into the material culture that was wrong or the, the different elements or aspects that were wrong or what we would like to have seen. But one of the things that, that I love about these movies um, is, is if it gets someone interested to go and visit this site if it gets someone interested to read about what actually happened then to me the movie has has done its its due diligence so despite all the jests that we poke at it um you know these type of movies hopefully inspire you know younger and, and newer generations back in 2000 when this came out to to get into the revolutionary war so my take on all historical films you know um if it, it does its job if we get more folks interested in, in the real places and the real events yeah, and then, go ahead, Kevin. I was just going to say, I think for all of the, the inaccuracies that we can find or the little nitpicking that we can do with it, I think one thing that the movie does really well is, is just shows the stakes of the winter of 1776 and how near run of a thing it was for Washington's army and just really how I think Washington, well, Jeff Daniels Washington says it in the movie that it's you know, due to the idiocy of war or providence or whatever it may be, but just really how incredible of a, a victory it was and how crucial those 10 crucial days ultimately became uh, and from December 26th to, to you know, mid-January, early January of 1770, uh, 1777. Yeah, now, like I said, it's a, it's a story that, you know, it's got Hollywood written all over it. So, you know, as a person who was, yeah, I think 16 when this came out, uh, you know, it definitely influenced me. Uh, you know, I really enjoyed it when I was a kid. It helped me get interested and excited. You know, I see a lot of people mention that they show this in high school classes and other things like that. I think it's a great uh, kind of intro to this campaign and hopefully yeah, it provokes people wanting to learn more. Uh, so, yeah, I know. And if any of you out there are, are interested in learning more about the campaign, check out Victory or Death. Uh, you can get it wherever books are sold. Um, and like I said, it kind of gives a brief overview of the of the campaign and then where those places are, because nothing beats going to the places where they where the history actually happened. Uh, you know, going down to Trenton, you know, unfortunately, I think uh, they canceled a lot of the uh, events going on this anniversary uh, due to COVID. Um, but there is a, a reenactment of the Battle of Princeton happening on January 2nd on Sunday. So if you get out to uh, you can probably check out the Princeton State Battlefield Park, uh, the, the Friends of the Princeton um, uh, Battlefield, they'll be able to give you some more information about that. Uh, but being on the actual ground where it happened, especially having the ability to have reenactors or living historians out there, it's a great way to connect with, uh, with the history. And ultimately, that's what we're all, we're all about here at Emerging Revolutionary War. So 
Uh, so yeah, yeah, read about it, watch the movies, uh, and then get out there to the actual places where they happened and, and, and take in the history, so. We, uh, we hope to see you in two weeks for our next Emerging Revolutionary War chat on uh, January the 9th. We will see you at 7 p.m. So mark your calendars for that. We'll have another great evening with some historians uh, in the field, as well as some historians from Emerging Revolutionary War. So on behalf of Emerging Revolutionary War and Mark Malloy and Kevin Pollack, we wish you all a happy holiday and a happy new year. All right. Thank you all. <laughs>